Welcome to Canada Files. I'm Valerie Pringle. My guest today is Suzanne Simard, who is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia and has spent her life observing forests. She has published 200 groundbreaking articles showing that trees exchange signals and resources through a hidden underground communication system. Her memoir, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, documents her revolutionary journey. Hello, Suzanne. Hello. Are you revolutionary? Are your ideas about trees and forests revolutionary? Well, I never thought that they were, but they are in so many ways. I didn't think they were because I grew up understanding forests as these really connected relational places. Um, and then I studied it and now I'm talking about it and people are going, wow, I never thought of forests that way. But I always did. Mm -hmm. So explain your premise. You know, when, how, when you say it in a nutshell, you know, are, are trees sentient? What's going on underground in between trees? What's happening in forests? Yeah, so we, you know, most of us think of trees as just these individual trees that are, you know, living in a forest and trying to get what they need. Of course they do, but what, what I've found out and realized in trying to express is that they're very social creatures. Um, they actually live in community. They live in social networks. Um, they're connected to one another. They have deep relationships, sophisticated relationships, and they're very responsive and communicative with each other. And once we start seeing trees as very much dependent on their, their society, their community, we start to understand them as, you know, different than, you know, that, that they're more fulsome, more whole, more holistic than we used to think that they were. So that brings on all kinds of thoughts about how deep are these trees, you know? What is it about their, you said sentient, um, that, that conjures up that they have purpose and agency and meaning in their lives. And the work that I do shows that they do. They have the ability to, to determine their own future in so many ways. You've spent your life really observing and listening to forests and trees. You grew up in the rainforest of British Columbia, you know, with an extended family, grandparents, loggers, I mean, <laughs> quite a cast of characters, actually. T tell me about your family. Yeah, so um, my family on my father's side, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, and my, my dad's family, all those generations were horse loggers. And that just meant that they, you know, they had, they had horses that they would actually take across the lake on, on these wharves and tugboats that they made by hand. All the boats and the tools, flumes that they built. My grandfather even built a water wheel, houseboats that they lived on when they were logging. All of that was done by hand, and I was just was born into that. But in total comfort in the forest. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it was where we lived, so there was no other way to know things. <laughs> yeah. There are a couple of origin stories you tell about your curiosity and the beginnings of the great why and what's going on. One of them is about the family dog Jiggs in an outhouse. <laughs> yeah, Jiggs was just part of our family. Um, Jiggs was a beagle dog and Uncle Wilfred had this big boat that he'd made. So he would be, you know, on the lake all the time with Jiggs at the bow of the boat. And Jiggs would be up there, you know, pointing the way, <laughs> or at least his nose was pointing the way. And one day, you know, us little kids, I was about six years old at the time, we wake up in the morning and we hear this howling and we all know it's Jigs and it's from in the forest where the outhouse is. <laughs> so we all go running up because we realize Jigs has fallen in the outhouse. <laughs> and so my uncle Wilfred comes running up the shore with his shovel and my grandpa with his, with his pickaxe and my dad and all the little kids are running up and we open up the outhouse door, look down and there's Jigs paddling around. <laughs> in the soup way down there. Um, and so, of course, we have to get Jigs out. Um, and so the men start to dig. And, you know, they're going... I was learning so much. I mean, I was, I was feeling really bad for Jigs, but I was completely mesmerized by what, what they were uncovering. 
because, you know, as they went down through the soil beside the outhouse to get them out, it was like all the colors, right? There was like this big thick moss layer, and then there was this white layer, and then there was this red layer, and then there was this yellow layer, and all the roots, well, there were white roots and brown roots, and there were mushrooms coming out of the top, and I was just like, oh my God, what is this masterpiece that's the soil? And, and I was just, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. And then all, you know, it took quite a while getting the stones out and finally my dad pulled up Jiggs' paws and pulled them out <laughs> and we ran down and threw them in the lake because he was No coming. kidding. <laughs> but that was, that was a moment for you. That was a, a big moment for me, yeah. Another moment that you described really well is you're 20 years old working for a logging company. Essentially, that's one of these clear-cutting logging companies. They're trying to plant more seedlings to replace everything that they've taken away. And you're documenting all these little dead plants. And you say, those yellow seedlings sent me on this long journey of a lifetime. You know, it was sort of the great why. And, and how, did you, how did you answer it? Why weren't those trees surviving? Why weren't the plants taking root? Yeah, so yeah, I got this job. I was like one of the first girls to get a summer job for a forest company, which I thought, you know, I'd really accomplish something. And I loved it because I loved the forest. Um, but yeah, my job was to follow these growing clear cuts <laughs> um, and plant the clear cuts with trees, or at least to, you know, to, to get planters to plant those clear cuts. And then I was, going back to them and seeing how they were doing and I would go back and the the little Douglas firs would be like yellow and not growing and I mean some would grow for sure but a lot of them didn't because um and so I would pull them out and I'd look at their roots and go well there's nothing going on here it's like a black tube going into the into the soil and then I would pull out you know ones that were growing naturally the ones that had come from the seed from the trees and then landed and germinated and the roots would be like everywhere and I have got What's the difference? Well, obviously there was a huge difference. The naturally regenerated trees were just finding their way to the nutrients in the water, whereas the planted ones that were in these plugs were kind of entombed in the plug. And so that got me thinking about roots. And then I was looking at the roots and they were covered with these, you know, colorful little fungal threads. And I started learning about this kind of fungus called a mycorrhiza that actually helps seedlings grow. And I could see this big difference between these. One had mycorrhizas in these complex root systems and the other one had neither of those. And so that's where I kind of got started in thinking about roots. So I came from a kid that loved dirt and soil. And from, ate it. And ate it and, and was mesmerized by it to going, ah, oh, I would like to study why these trees are are not doing doing so well in a soil that should be very productive and very supportive of their growth. But that sent you off on, well, the journey you're still on, decades yeah. and decades. Yeah. Well, you know, I because I grew up in old growth forests and I've watched over my lifetime. So I was born in 1960. And imagine, you know, Canada and British Columbia where I lived was just covered with old forests. And then I became part of this industry that was cutting them down and the cutting was going on and on and and accelerating and soon the vast landscape of old forest was turning to a vast landscape of clear cuts and I, I just started to it became more and more urgent to me to to contribute to to slowing this down and figuring out what we were doing and are we replacing, you know, these beautiful old growth forests with sickly plantations? And, and shouldn't we think about this some more and solve some of these problems? So that became my life's work. When you describe your work in the forest and endless experiments and time in the forest, the danger, I mean, I'm thinking on so many levels of you working with Roundup, which yeah. was used so extensively, yeah. so toxic, Still is. and you know, r neutron probes, radioactive carbon, yeah. which you're dealing with and trying to protect yourself from, let alone the grizzly bears that were <laughs> really chasing you up trees. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you think of experiments and you think of scientists, you think of them in labs, right, with test tubes or, or you know, or some electro, electrode or, some, or bacteria in a petri dish, 
when you're doing research in forests, it's a completely different thing. Because, yeah, you're living that experiment. You're, you're surviving in your experiment because there are bears around, cougars, wolves. Um, and then the instruments we use are, yeah, can be really dangerous, even though at the time I'm like, oh, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll get by. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll, I just got to do it and I'll get by. And I think the other thing to, to think about too is that the things that we're studying are huge. Trees are huge, especially in the rainforest. Like they can have diameters that are meters wide and be 50 meters tall. Um, and they live a long, long time. And so when you're doing experiments, these are long experiments, you know, and, and longer than your lifetime. And so when you set something up, you know, it, it's big. And it's long, and you need lots of people involved. So it's actually, you know, in that way, it's just so much fun because it, it has to involve lots of students and other colleagues. It's teamwork. Um, and then you're, you're working in these big areas with big animals around you, like bears. You're lucky you weren't <laughs> killed, really, by the bears. Yeah, honestly, I, I was. Because especially in the, in the 80s, when I worked alone, alone in grizzly country a lot, um, you know, they just put us out there, um, or at least You spent me. quite a while in a tree at one point, yeah. <laughs> thinking you may never come down, waiting for the grizzly to leave. Yeah, yeah. This was in uh, uh, a tributary to the Fraser River, and it was right near where I was working, and my friend Gina and I had gone hiking, and we knew there were grizzlies up in the valley. This was their territory, even though I really wanted to spend my 22nd birthday up there. And she was in front of me, and all of a sudden she stopped, and I'm like, what's going on? And she goes, grizzly. And only about five feet away from her was this huge mama grizzly with two cubs right beside her. And she's looking at us like, you know, and Jean's looking at her and she goes, I'm going up that tree. And so I'm going, oh, I'll go up this tree over here. And then the mama takes her cubs off to another tree. And so we're all climbing our trees. Well, the cubs are climbing. She can't climb because she's too big. And it took quite a while. Um, we were up there about an hour, and Mama Grizzly finally kind of got bored, and or figured we were, you know, we were fine up there, and got her cubs down out of the tree, and and they we could hear them leaving, and so finally, you know, just as it's getting dark, we come down from our trees and we just get the heck out of there as fast as possible. <laughs> Tell me about the eureka moment when you heard trees talking to each other birch to fir, after all the experiments you'd been doing, you know, you found evidence that something was going on between. Yeah, I, I'd long had this idea, even when I was doing my master's degree, which is, bef I was, you know, what we're talking about is an experiment I did during my doctoral studies. Um, but I thought in my master's experiment where I was looking at how trees are competing for water and nutrients, I thought, what if, what if they shared them? And so I would, I, in my experiment, I labeled the Douglas fir with a radioactive tagged carbon dioxide. So I put a bag over the tree, injected the CO2 with C14 on it, and then the, the birch, I put a bag on it and injected carbon-13 CO2, a stable isotope, and then waited. And then I went with the Geiger counter um, and tested to see whether or not I was able to label these trees properly. And so there were the donor trees that I had labeled, and I could hear the radioactivity, you know, with the, the Geiger counter going. Ch -ch 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 -ch. And then I went went over to the fir because if it had received any of this radioactivity, I would be able to hear it. So I go up to it with the Geiger counter, and I can hear a little crackle, crackle. And that was when I knew that something had happened. Something had moved from this tree to this tree, and of course. That was just kind of the beginning, but that was an incredible moment. And then getting the data back when we had to analyze it more carefully in a lab in Victoria, <laughs> which is a whole nother story, but I finally got the data back and I could see that the, this carbon-14 and carbon-13 were moving back and forth between the birch and the fir, and that the birch was sending more carbon to fir than fir was sending back to it. So that was an incredible moment because I knew they were communicating back and forth between each other. Just, you know, your head must have blown off. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> now, you wrote an article that was on the cover of, of Nature magazine. That yes. That was 1997. Yes. Another, you know, real breakthrough moment for you. 
the description of what the the, the wood wide web. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the paper that resulted from that experiment. It was so mind blowing that these trees out in the forest were sharing or trading carbon back and forth between them. You know, until that moment, we kind of knew that that the mycorrhizal fun fungi could link trees together. That was kind of established, all, I say kind of, because it was all very new at that time. Um, there had been an experiment done before in the lab showing that they that trees could connect. But I was the first one to show that that this carbon was moving back and forth through these networks, or at least that we, the experimental design suggested that they were moving through these networks. And so that was so mind blowing. Um, it even, you know, the, the other, story that was competing for the cover of nature was was the gemo, genome of the fruit fly back then. It was the first time anybody had done a whole genomic sweet sequence of an organism and there was the picture of the birch and fir instead of the fruit fly and I was like oh because it was so mind-blowing. Wow but you know there was pushback then there continues to be pushback obviously I mean one quote we can't publish articles by people who think they can just dance through the forest looking at trees. <laughs> description of you supposedly and you know it's still people now saying the science is scarce and unsettled and we can't yeah. base policy on it. You've had a lot of people um, criticizing, attacking yeah. your work. Yes that's right. Um, you know even recently there's been an attack on my work um, and I think you know I mean science is an evolving thing but there have been so many experiments Honestly, I've done hundreds of experiments and dozens showing that, that uh, this carbon, water, or nitrogen can move from one tree to another. What we found is that the amount that moves ranges from a tiny amounts to quite a, quite a large amount. In my studies, up to 10% of the carbon that's fixed in that group of plants or through photosynthesis is moving back and forth between these trees. In another study in Europe where they did labeling of large trees, they're finding 40% of the carbon they think is moving between the trees through mycorrhizal networks. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence that shows that there's a lot of movement below ground. A lot of it is moving through these networks. And I think part of the issue comes from, well, can we see them or do we believe this? And honestly, after 30 years of studying this, I'm, I'm at the point where we have, um, we have to recognize the complexity of these, of these interactions, these conversations between trees. It's part of how they, they live as forests, that they're in communication, um, that they're constantly attuned to each other through this back and forth movement. And when we know that, and we know that we're clear cutting forests and taking down the big old trees, as well as everything else in a clear cut, that we're really undermining the ability of the forest to recover from these, from because the network is such a fundamental process to the growth and recovery of a forest. That, you know, the critics also say, well, we don't know enough to act on this. Well, I'm like, you know what, the status quo is to take out all the trees. Is that not something that we should act on? For many reasons, and this one is one of the many reasons that we know these old trees are important or you know, these communication uh, pathways are really important in the recovery of the forest. You began to focus on those big old trees yeah. um, that you call hub trees. Even you, you said at one point mother or father tree because I guess they're sort of, yeah. they have different pronouns. Yeah. Um, but mother tree is where you've settled. Yes, so the reason for that is, um, you know, as you said, the, the field has been controversial. So at one point, I was getting so tired of the controversies that I, you know, about the arguments, is this real, is it not, what does it matter? Um, I thought, well, let's just make a map of what the networks look in the forest, forest. What we found in making the map of the network is that looking at one fungal species, species using very uh, highly technical DNA analysis that all of the trees were connected together by these mycorrhizal fungi. And that the, that the biggest trees were the biggest hubs of those networks. So they really stood out as linking all the trees, so many trees in the forest. And smaller trees were also in that network, but they had smaller root systems, so it didn't have as many linkages as the big old trees. And so these big old trees emerged as the, the linchpins in the forest, the key connectors in the forest. 
And so what we found is that the survival of the seedlings that are linked into the network of the old trees is much greater than survival of those that are not. In fact, if they don't link into a network and become colonized, they die. And so then I started calling them mother trees because they were nurturing the forest. It's interesting how popular culture you know, has embraced the idea so readily. I mean, we saw um, Avatar, you must have loved the Tree of Souls, or you know, even Ants from Lord of the Rings, or yeah, um, The Overstory, the yes. Pulitzer Prize winning book, and you're kind of a character in that book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I was, I was watching Ted Lasso the other day and heard your name. <laughs> so I'm thinking, it's interesting, are people inclined to believe this? Do they instinctively know this? Why has popular culture kind of latched on this more while there's still some controversy in science? I think there's a number of reasons. Um, I think, one, we're social creatures, and so we understand how that, those relationships work. You know, we, we understand that we're relational to in the people around us. We're, we're affected by our community, and we affect our community. And so that a forest would have those qualities as well really resonates with us. And I think people being in the forest, that they feel the, the essence of a forest, the emergent things that come out of a forest, the, um, you know, the, the clean air, the smells, that it's more than just a bunch of trees. It's a whole forest, it's a whole social community. So we get that as people. Um, the other thing is that um, you know, we're in this moment in history where climate is changing really quickly. We're seeing our landscapes being clear cut. Um, we're, you know, we're aware as people, as humans, that there are big changes happening and that what happens in forests is very much connected to that. And we, we know that you know, when we, when we clear cut forests that we're actually adding to climate change and we're reducing our ability to mitigate climate change. And so there's a lot of worry on the one hand and there's also a lot of innate knowledge as, as creatures of this earth, of social creatures. And so it's that moment of realization that we really need to start treating our forests with more respect um, because they're so essential to life, our life on this planet. A good way to think about that is when a tree breathes out oxygen, we breathe it in. We're connected. And indigenous knowledge, obviously, and you've spent a lot of time with nations in uh, British Columbia talking about this in your Mother Tree Project. You know, there's a connection. Yes, so, yes, very much. I'm working with nations in British Columbia in um, trying to protect the remaining mother trees. So just keep in mind, again, like we're still cutting down these ancient trees every single day, um, and we're not we're not honoring <laughs> those connections that we need to be intact in the land. We have not been honoring the land, and and so we. I'm working with the nations to try to, to mitigate that, to stop the clear cutting. I mean, it's got to stop. So I think there's a realization politically, um, certainly there's a realization socially, um, the people know. And so government has got to, you know, keep up with the people and what we want. You probably were put on this planet for this cause. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I, I was, actually. Do you think it's a mystery or is this ultimately knowable? Oh, it's ultimately knowable. I think that, um, you know, of course there's always gonna be things we don't know. That's the beauty of life, right? That's all the things that we, we, we marvel at, like how, how is there a, a dawn chorus in the morning when you wake up and all the birds are singing and it's a symphony. Things that we don't know, all those relationships between the birds and the trees. Some things we're not gonna know, but we know enough to change what we're doing now to protect our future generations. We know enough that we need to save these old trees. We know enough to stop clear cutting the remaining old growth forests. We know enough to restore forests so that they are again carbon sinks again and homes for biodiversity. We can act on that. That's not rocket science. That's just good thinking. So the question we ask at the end of every interview is what does being Canadian mean to you? You know, I've always been very proud to be a Canadian. I, I feel um, I feel so connected to the land. I grew up in the forest. I feel like we have this 
place to discover, to explore, to take care of, to be responsible for. I feel a great pride in taking on that responsibility. I'm proud of, um, you know, that we have a great diversity of people here. And, and we have First Nations whose livelihoods can still, are still intact, more or less, that they can recover what they've lost in, in a large way as well. I'm proud of our truth and reconciliation uh, intentions, and I think, and I really want that to be successful. I think, I think it's something we can be, you know, leaders and proud of our, our successes in those areas. So it's that all of that together that, to me, is is part of being Canadian. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Valerie. It's been really fun. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Kathy and George Dombrowski, as well as the following donors. Ted and Alice Kernahan, the Browning Watt Foundation, Mary Davy, Michael McCain and family, Jim and Sandra Petbledo, Tony and Sherry Fell, Bryce and Nikki Douglas, Richard Wernham and Julia West, Charles and Marilyn Bailey, Richard Pilosoff, Clench House Foundation, David and Cheryl Carr, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association. <laughs>